Hello friends, welcome to the ATC Double Cut. In this episode, we're going to be talking about turf grass management in 2024 and some of the organic matter issues and sand top dressing and nitrogen rates. I have a special guest today. It is Adam Miller from Miller Consulting and from Turfgrass. Welcome to the ATC Double Cut, Adam. Thanks for having me, Micah. I'm excited to talk some turf tonight. Yes, we have all kinds of turf to talk about. Uh, and it seems like a really exciting time with some of the innovations that are happening with the way people manage grass and mostly I'll be talking about potting green surfaces with the organic matter and nitrogen rates. It's pretty cool. You uh, are doing work in the United States and with turf grass, that's a Ireland based company, isn't it? Yeah, they've been around for 25 years or so. I think a lot of their activity has been in Ireland, parts of the UK and, and Europe, but they've also got uh, projects that have happened really in your neck of the woods in Asia um, you know, so Middle East and, and more projects in North America. That's really where I come in is to sort of lead up the North American side of things. But you have, I, I saw you have made a couple trips to Europe, uh, or at least one. Yeah, I, I did two and they came at a <clears throat> kind of a difficult time. We just, uh, had our second, uh, child and, uh, about three weeks later, uh, was the, uh, the first turf grass trip overseas to connect, fill in some gaps where um, some of their team members, uh, I think one of their agronomists, JP, he uh, he had back surgery. So uh, filled in and just kind of got oriented a little bit with the team. Uh, so did a tour of a number of golf courses that we've supported along the years. Um, so that was the first one in July and then did another trip in uh, late September where I visited a couple of the same golf courses and then stopped over to Adair Manor, which is one of our um, one of our big clients. They've obviously got the uh, 2027 Ryder Cup, so that's exciting. And then um, Turfgrass really supports the agronomy side of things at the Solheim Cup, so it was neat to be able to then kind of tag off the visits uh, to Europe and Ireland, and then head back to uh, to Europe and the south of Spain and work the Solheim Cup. That's, that's, uh, like a, that's like a dream trip of a lifetime for some people. And you get to do that just as part of your work. That's pretty cool. Um, so, uh, you're quite familiar then with how people are managing grass and what the surfaces are like in, in Europe, in the United States. And I, I want to talk about that a little bit. Let's go ahead and kick off this double cut with, uh, a recent blog post uh, and kind of use this as a starting point for our discussion. The post I'm showing, I'll put a direct link to it in the show notes. It has a title of turf grass growth ratio, nitrogen harvest and fertilizer adjustment. And it's really about how much we grow the grass. And I know you've been interested in this for a long time because even your master's work at Purdue university was looking at organic matter management and sand top dressing and nitrogen rate and shoot density and summer quality and all of that kind of stuff. So what, what years were you at, uh, in grad school? I was in grad school at Purdue from 2006 to 2008. So really, a a, a lot of, a lot of projects in a short time period, but it was a really great experience there working closely with Kale Bigelow and, uh, Jared Nemitz, who's a superintendent at the Ford Field and River Club, uh, just outside of Savannah. I think you know him. Um, so yeah, it was a short time, but a lot of projects, a lot of cool uh, exposure to, to different ways of, uh, of researching different aspects of golf turf management. So that's that's uh, 16, 16 to 18 years ago. So yeah. almost, almost two decades ago. So... And I think you've kind of been thinking about these topics uh, for a long time. Uh, and and it seems like these topics are even more, uh, they're equally important as they were back then. They Maybe people are thinking about them in even more detail now. Let's, let's uh, skim through this blog post real quick. And, and I want to highlight a couple of things in this 
posts that I think would could be useful for people. And then, then let's just have a discussion about kind of how we would use uh, some of the techniques and technologies that are available to us today and what we might recommend compared to what we've studied or recommended in the past. Um, I, in this blog post, uh, I shared a couple of equations. Uh, I referred to a ATC office hours episode where I talked with Jason Haynes who invented the growth ratio and, or, or came up with a, yeah, he invented it. He came up with the idea for the growth ratio and, uh, also Bjarni Hannison. And we, we talked about what the growth ratio is, how you can kind of get a site specific evaluation of how much your grass is growing compared to how much you would expect it to grow given the recent weather. So it's, it turns out to be quite useful and possibly something that can be used to adjust nitrogen rate and to adjust sand top dressing. And, um, as, as we had that discussion, some people had a couple of questions. So this blog post was meant to give the details about a couple of equations. One of them was how to estimate nitrogen harvesting clippings. And when you measure the clipping volume, you can expect that for most grass species, the dry weight of the clippings will be about 6% of the uncompressed fresh, fresh weight. And then once you know what the dry weight of the clippings is, you can estimate what the nitrogen content would be, or you can measure the nitrogen content in the dry clippings. And from that, it's, it's pretty easy to figure out how, how much nitrogens are, how much nitrogen is estimated to have been harvested in the clippings. So I shared how that calculation works. And then in the second part of the post, I, I had a heading called adjusting nitrogen rate using the growth ratio. And I sh shared the equation that I would use, which is our standard nitrogen rate multiplied by the actual, uh, sorry, the, the desired growth ratio divide, divided by the actual growth ratio. So if you, if you take your standard nitrogen rate and multiply it times the desired growth ratio divided by the actual growth ratio, it gives you a proportional adjustment of your standard nitrogen rate that is directly proportional to how much the grass is growing above or below the way that you might like the grass to be growing. So I want to recommend to people, if you're interested in any of this, check out that blog post, get those equations, see if you can calculate that for your site. Now, I know most people are listening to this, so I don't want to talk about too many equations, but, uh, that that's like a bit more detail than we were doing. I checked your master's, uh, article, uh, sorry, your master's research article that was published in applied turf grass science. And I, and I just skimmed through the abstract of that this morning and it was two nitrogen rates that were fixed. And I think that it was like 112 kilograms uh, per hectare and 196 kilograms per hectare was the high rate. So you had like a low rate of nitrogen, high rate of nitrogen. And, and I think, uh, maybe A4, L93, and Pencross or something. Yep. That's like a really standard way to do things is have these fixed nitrogen rates. When I was a grad student, I had fixed nitrogen rates too. But what I'm recommending now, what I recommend in that blog post, if I was managing grass today, I wouldn't put the same amount of nitrogen every time I fertilize, or certainly not on the same time schedule. I would be adjusting the rate based on how much I want the grass to grow and based on how much it's growing. Do, do you think that's crazy or do you think it's, it's better to do it the way the research is done? No, I mean, that's sort of the, the limitation with research and trying to have replicated, you know, replicated treatments year over year to kind of get a sense for what's going on in the real world. I mean, I don't, I don't know many superintendents, maybe not any that, just do the same thing week after week after week, year after year after year, you know, especially with things like nitrogen, it's, it's highly dynamic. And I see superintendents that are constantly changing their application rates for their soluble weekly programs. And, you know, based on clipping yields and based on turf grass performance and, and what the weather looks like. And, and even going as far as to say, you know what, we've got, 
hot, humid conditions, we know things are just going to grow naturally through soil mineralization. Like let's hold nitrogen out of the tank, you know, entirely for a, a spray or two here or there. So yeah, there's definitely, you know, kind of trying to take the research side of things and moving it into, you know, actually what happens on a golf course. I think that's a, a difficult proposition to overcome when you look at kind of the structure of what what's required for research to kind of pass, um, you know, pass the bar and, and get to the published state, so to speak. Do you, do you think that it's systematic enough to say we're measuring the clipping volume, we are adjusting the nitrogen rate based on this equation? Like, to me, that's, that's a very systematic and scientific way to do it. I, I would think that would be a nice way to do a research project to allow a, a research project to be something that's a little bit more similar to the way that nitrogen uh, might get adjusted by a golf course superintendent trying to produce really high quality surfaces week in and week out uh, and dealing with the reality of the weather this year is different than it was last year. So you, so you necessarily need to make adjustments. Would it Would it be... So the, the question is, does that seem scientific to you or just kind of random and, and haphazard? No, I, I do think there's a, a much more scientific approach there than um, that, that would allow the research side of, of things to, to take more of that dynamic approach with how they um, build out treatments and, and things like that. So I, I do think that's a, a good starting point, you know, just takes sort of the right researcher and graduate student to to take that on, and and then really the right the right open mindedness from the academic community that hey, this is a this is a shift in how we're looking at things, and and here are the reasons why, and here's how it's done. I mean that's so much of it that you want to be able to document how this is done. You know, can you get repeatable results from one location to another? And you know, I, I think certainly there's there's more promise now with these types of equations than there has been in the past. Do you, to use that kind of equation, we need to be measuring clipping volume, we, right? So, so to have the growth ratio, you need to know how much the grass is growing. Do you, I don't, I don't visit many golf courses in the United States. Um, and I, I know you, you either communicate with or visit a lot more golf courses in the United States than I do. Do you have any idea, like what percentage of courses do you think are, not not just checking the clippings, which everybody checks the clippings, but yeah. measuring every time the grass is mown, measuring the clipping volume. Do you have do you have an idea of, on percentage right now? It's a great question, Micah. You know, most of my clients are spread out across the the Northeast, uh, Canada, and the Midwest, and I would say it's still uh, the minority of the superintendents that I work with closely. Are, are doing a lot of in-depth uh, clipping measurements. That, like you said, everyone looks at the baskets, everyone checks, um, but it's still the minority. It, it's, it's, it's more than 25%, you know, it's, but it's probably not more than 50. So somewhere in that zone. But Ooh. I think once people, once people do it, they see the value. The, the interesting thing that um, I'm curious to see where it will go with the number of the courses that I work with that do measure clippings, you know, they don't all record them. Like they, they have the bucket, they, they keep track, but they do it so often that that number is almost kind of like a moisture meter number. in a lot of, a lot of cases where they know it's specific to their site, they don't really have a whole lot of interest in comparing their site to another. And they just kind of know, like, we want to be, you know, somewhere between a half a liter and, and one liter per thousand square feet. And if we're in that zone, we feel good. If we're not in that zone, you know, we maybe need to think at things, think about things. So I think that'll be the interesting part of this too, is there's definitely huge value in measuring clipping volumes, but will people really do the recording? And obviously there's different, different ways to do that with Excel and different platforms. Um, but the first step to me is just getting out there for superintendents and their staffs to measure clippings from you know a single green it's it, no one has that kind of just okay we've got plenty of time let's do it but 
there's there's value in making that that time and it doesn't take as much time as what most people think uh, so I, I think it's a really great first step for for people to move into that direction yeah that that's uh an interesting answer i i would guess like what the places that i visit uh places i work with probably it's pretty high because a lot of people that want to work with me are are interested in this kind of stuff um places that i just visit i i would guess that overall it's like yeah 5 or 10% of places are right. are measuring clipping volume that you know in the us people push the conditions to be a little bit better i i feel like you know over the past 25 years or so um uh, well, certainly, I, I noticed this when I'm measuring green speed, um, and and I talked I talked with an anonymous superintendent uh, in November, and he he didn't believe the green speed numbers that I was sharing because I said, well, I I did a survey of 30 different golf courses in Thailand, and the average green speed was like nine feet, and he's like, you have to be kidding me, like that because in the U S apparently that's, you know, he, he thinks that's kind of shockingly low. And then I said, uh, and I've measured in Japan, I, I measured at 19 golf courses in Japan in a, in another survey. And the average green speed was in the eights. And they're like, for some people, they're just baffled at those numbers because in the United States, a lot of places are 10, 11, 12, uh, on on average and and so if that's the average then it's sometimes it's it's 12.5 it's 13 it's it's really high numbers and uh so uh i think in the united states if you're going to be um cutting the grass short enough and and regulating the growth enough cutting the nitrogen low enough so that you can tolerate that amount of low mowing I think it, it can be really helpful to measure how much the grass is growing uh, because if the grass is growing too fast, you won't get those kind of green speeds it, and, and the grass is under a bit more stress if it's, if it's being pushed to achieve those speeds. And, and I feel like uh, in, in some of the other parts of the world, maybe where people aren't pushing to have those kind of speeds, they can get away with just doing things the same way that they did it 20 or 30 years ago. It's, it's, uh, you just grow the grass and you mow it and and if you know the clippings or you don't know the clippings and nobody's complaining about the green speed why why do you need to do any more so mm -hmm. I, I feel like maybe even though this is something that i learned about in asia um and i i uh started recommending it because i realized it's so useful uh i feel like it's more like in america and canada uh, where it's really picked up a lot of steam and people are like, wow, this is, this is a tool that they can use to get those conditions even more consistently. Yeah, it, it really is. And if I look kind of look back specifically in the Northeast over my uh, time sort of with the USGA, there, there was this, this pendulum and, and I started with the USGA in 2008 and that was right as, sort of the anthracnose research was really kicking off. And if we look at kind of fertility, fertility regimes, and I kind of just, I asked a bunch of uh, the old USG agronomists when I first started, like, give me the average fertility, you know, nitrogen in particular, uh, that, that you would recommend all the way back in the seventies and eighties and nineties. And it was up into 2010 when I uh, asked all those guys and it, there was this huge reduction in nitrogen in kind of the late 90s, early 2000s, and that's when anthracnose really started to take off on a lot of polyannual greens. And then we started to follow this anthracnose, you know, BMP program, and a lot of people were increasing the nitrogen applications and, you know, moving more into this programmed approach, kind of a, more of a static weekly rates of you know 0 0.08 or 0 0.1 pounds of nitrogen per thousand and now we're moving back towards the other direction of let's scale things back when we know we've got growth that's going to happen and let's you know make sure we've got a good kind of gauge as to what's happening and how low we're going to you know take our fertility levels the nitrogen being the main one and if we're checking clipping yields that at least is going to give us a little bit of a reality check to say okay 
we haven't grown much grass in the past three, four, five, you know, five weeks. Um, we're getting probably a little too lean and maybe we're, we're exposing ourselves open to some thinning or some anthracnose, you know, so it's kind of an early indicator in my mind of, you know, how low can we go? And, you know, it's, it's allowed people, I think, to, to scale their nitrogen back to, you know, in a, in a more cautious and, and safe way. And the playability is, you know, definitely improved because of that. That's, that's what I've noticed also. Um, I just, uh, I think clipping volume is so useful uh, because the best playing conditions are when the grass is growing the slowest. So if you think about tournament conditions, you, you want basically to get no clippings. That's, that would be ideal for a tournament if you could get no clippings, but you can't maintain a busy golf course for very long. You can't maintain a golf course with a lot of disease pressure or weed pressure or insect pressure with no growth. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to find a way to balance the playing quality that you get with really slow growth. Um, without going too far. And so I call that like the edge of the cliff. How, how do you get close to the edge of the cliff without going over it? You need to measure exactly how much the grass is growing. That's where I think the clipping volume is so useful. And I guess, um, uh, right now it seems like in America, Canada, um, there's other places around the world where people are pushing, uh, pushing close to that cliff edge too, but it certainly seems that a lot of places in North America are, and that's where I think clipping volume can be really helpful for them. Um, because, uh, then there's the other problem. If you grow the grass too fast, you're going to produce more above ground growth. I presume that in most cases, you're also going to produce more below ground growth. And if you produce more below ground growth that can lead to thatch and organic material in the soil that needs to get dealt with. So another benefit of growing the grass at just the right rate is minimizing the organic matter accumulation. Yeah, I completely agree. And obviously that's a, a huge talking point, um, these days with, you know, the play volumes are so high at a lot of golf courses. They're, they're under tremendous amount of stress from just environmental extremes. And, you know, we've got golfers demanding perfect conditions day in and day out. Um, if you do have too much organic matter, it, it's no one's happy because then you've got to go out there and do some disruptive practices. So recognizing that if you can limit how much you're growing and limit how much organic matter you have and get that under control, then maybe you can scale back on doing some of those disruptive practices and still produce an excellent surface and, you know, allow the golfers to then have more days of, of high quality conditions. You know, it, it's a, that's a, it seems like a really popular topic these days. And I've certainly heard you talk about it as well. Let's talk about that in the context of the last 16 or 18 years you had, I checked an abstract from the, maybe the 2006 or some 2007, 2008 era from the agronomy and crops and soil science society meetings. And it had a title of it. It was your presentation. It was evaluating five sand top dressing programs on three bank grass cultivars to find the top dressing requirement, something like that. And mm -hmm. I don't know that that, that was your thesis main project. Did you ever publish that or was it just in your thesis? No, it was just in my, just in my thesis, unfortunately. So we, we never got it published. It, uh, it, it was on the back burner for a while, but, uh, I moved on from Purdue and, and, was uh was, was extremely busy right away with uh with visiting golf courses with the usga so unfortunately we didn't get it published it's still something i know kale and i have uh, have talked about we should we should try to dust it off and, and try to get it out there because it's still relevant yeah i uh i'm thinking of the cation exchange capacity project that i did uh which was like i thought it was the most interesting part of my phd research and uh we never we never published that um 
but yeah, I know how it goes. There's so, uh, so much stuff that we learn and, and we know, but we don't publish it. So, uh, anyway, we have a lifetime of, of that type of work. If, if we want to work on, on writing projects, uh, anyway, it, it was different, uh, sand particle sizes, right? Uh, what were, what were those five sand top dressing mm, programs? Yeah. Was it, was it particle sizes or also amounts? So it was, it was both. It was, so we had basically five, five treatments split amongst those three different varieties, uh, Pancross, LNA3 and A4, and then two fertility regimes within that. But the main treatments were top dressing basically with a medium coarse sand that matched the existing root zone. Um, and then that was just top dressed, no aeration. And then the other four treatments were a combination of top dressing um, once with aeration with the coarse sand, once with, um, let's see, once with aeration, we're using a fine sand, then top dressing through the regular season, um, and then uh, a, two combinations of, of each. So we looked at the different sand sizes um, and top dressing frequencies, kind of looking at if someone just aerated twice a year, what does that look like? And then looking at if someone aerated twice a year and top dressed throughout the season, top dressed once, one with a coarse, medium coarse sand that matched the root zone, and then another with the sand that was significantly finer than what the grain was built out of. And generally it was better to put sand and generally better to uh, use the medium coarse, wasn't it? It, it was. The, the caveat here, and this is where if we would get around to uh, to publishing this, I think it would be it would be a nice compliment to some of the work that's been done mainly out of Rutgers more recently, looking at top dressing with more of a medium fine sand. So the fine sand that we used was not too dissimilar to some of the sands that were used that were being used in kind of the mid two thousands um, and even a little bit to this day on some of the ultra dwarf greens, where it's just so difficult to work the the, the particles into the canopy. The fine sand that we had, I think it was like 60% of the distribution was all in the fine sand category. So 0.15 millimeters to 0.25 millimeters. So not anywhere close to meeting USDA specs. So much, much finer. Um, and so in that scenario, we, we dramatically changed the physical performance of the green. In just three years, the top, I think two and a half, three inches or so, no longer met USJ specs. It was holding more moisture. Um, it was softer in the plots where we had pancross, top dressed a lot and finer sand, you know, more brushing, more sand that actually contributed to more moss. Uh, so it was interesting research. And, and again, I think it kind of draws the line of like, you can go too fine with top dressing. Um, and more recently, the research from Rutgers looked at more of a medium fine sand that just barely fell out of USJ specs. And it's like, okay, that, that looks more promising. They had some really good results with that sand. Uh, so kind of where, 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 where do you get closer to that? You know, do not go finer than this line. Um, so we clearly know with the research that I did that that's too fine. That can lead to some, some long-term problems. You shared a, a chart on Twitter last week that got quite a bit of uh response from uh some uh well from Bert Sandell in in Sweden uh from from myself from a couple other people and it's it's a really common type of chart it's a particle size distribution curve or sometimes it's called a s curve and if you look at uh particle size distribution reports that come from uh a lot of labs that test road-based material. So when I talk to my engineering friends or, or when they, you know, if they test, uh, test a sand in Thailand or test a sand in Japan, it, it's not from a golf course specific testing laboratory. It's, it's from a more engineering, uh, civil engineering type of laboratory. And it often comes with one of these, uh, curves, a particle size distribution curve. And yet when we get a, a report from most uh, turf grass soil testing laboratories, it's generally just the information presented in tables. And you shared this chart and it's got the 
uh, USGA recommendations, uh, like a, a line that shows where the fine limit would be if a sand was still going to meet the recommendations and also the course limit. And then you can see a line that shows the, the actual sand that was tested. And I was like, that's so cool. I'm glad that you're working on that. Can you give me some background on, uh, on your interest in that type of chart and, and what potential you see for, for using that to maybe, I mean, I guess maybe it could help us to identify uh, some top dressing sands. Yeah. So I first saw a chart like that actually in my grad school days from Hurston's book, um, you know, golf greens, history, design, construction, something like that. And it, it resonated with me that it was easier to kind of quickly look at a sand to kind of get a sense for where it, where it fell on the spectrum of, does it meet USGA specifications, but is it on the coarse side? Is it on the fine side? And to me, that's where the tables are difficult to kind of know where you're at. You can quickly realize, yeah, the, the green meets USGA specs, but where does it err on the fine side, on the coarse side? And I would say in general, my interest is to try to educate people on the fact that the USGA specs are intentionally broad. They're very wide. So the green could be built worldwide by architects and builders um, and, and produce a, a high quality playing surface. But because they're so wide, I feel like people tended to err on the coarser side of things. We all know the problems with not having enough drainage. And so the, you know, the focus oftentimes then gets pushed towards, well, let's, let's make sure this has rapid infiltration and more coarse particles and, you know, kind of more aeration or air filled porosity than capillary porosity. And so I wanted to look at that chart to kind of, can we, can we kind of help educate people or an easier way to see where their potential root zone mixes or, or top dressing sand sizes kind of fall within the USGA specs. And so I felt like that maybe, makes things a little bit easier when you're selecting a root zone. Um, like I said, same thing, looking at top dressing sands, but then you could compare it year over year. And that's what I did as part of my master's work was we knew we were top dressing with a sign that uh, with a sand that was way outside of specs. And I wanted to see how quickly would we basically change that top from, you know, meeting specs in 2005 before I got there. So then in 2008, it no longer met the specs. And so we plotted each year of the particle size analysis. And we just saw that line moving further and further towards the fine end of the spectrum to the point where it eventually no longer met USDA specifications. So I think there's a lot of use for that type of graph. It's not, it's not perfect. Um, USDA recommendations talk about percent retained. And those graphs work best, I think, when it's more of like the percent of material that passes through, um, which are, they're the same number, but because there's an upper limit with the fine sand category, the very fine sand category, the combination of coarse particles, very coarse particles, and then there's a lower limit with medium and coarse, it's, it gets a little bit complicated there. So um, yeah, going to continue to refine it because I, I do think it's, it's, it's another way to view the same data. And if it can make things a little bit easier for people to recognize, like, where does this mix fall? Is it, is it too fine? Is it too coarse? Or is it sort of just right? Um, you know, I think it could hopefully give people the ability to select a root some mix that's more tailored to their, to their site and their climate. Yeah. I, I think there's opportunities to um, analyze the sand test data, not, not to do any more tests, but just to make more calculations uh, and and maybe some different visual um, presentations of the test results rather than the, the way that we've always been doing it, just putting it in tables. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like, let's take the uh, coefficient of uniformity value, uh, the CU, which I, I don't know if that was something that was a big deal back in the 90s. Uh, I don't know when it got added uh, to say, okay, the minimum is 1.8, the maximum is 3.5. Is that something that was added uh, in the 20, 2018 update? Do you, do you recall? Yes, there was, I think there was sort of the, the, the more upper limit 
that that was added. There was certainly more language added uh, around um, the CU and and why that's important and why people are are looking into that more so now than than what they were before. It was in there. I, I'm drawing a blank as to when it would would first got in there, but um, it's definitely become more of a talking point and of more interest really over the last decade than uh, than the early part of my career. Yeah, me, me too. I I first I, I always knew it was kind of on a report, but I never paid attention to it. I'm just like, okay, there's a, another number. Um, but I was always just looking at particle sizes and and mm-hmm. did is it is it above this threshold or is it below that maximum? Uh, like, so does it meet the gravel? Does it meet the sand? Does it meet the coarse sand? Does it meet the f- me- medium and fine sand? Uh, it, does it meet all of these? I was just checking on the table. And then there was other information on the report. I guess I was always looking at porosity and checking mm-hmm. the saturated hydraulic conductivity. And, you know, that's kind of, kind of how I would evaluate a sand. And now people are like, well, wait, but if you have a higher CU, if you have uh, more variation in the sizes of the sand particles, then that surface should be firmer. And then a lot of people think, well, I would rather use a sand that's going to meet the specifications and it's also going to be firmer. So that's, that's something that people are interested in. And then you can look at places like Royal Melbourne, uh, which is using a, a, a sand that's natural to that site. And that sand does not meet the USGA recommendations, but it has a, a CU that's also relatively high. Um, and then people can watch that on TV or they can go play Royal Melbourne and they can say, wow, those surfaces are firm, like nothing I've seen before. And then they think, okay, if I, if I want to, if I want to duplicate that kind of, uh, surface or try to get something that's approaching that level of firmness, maybe it would make sense to use a sand that has that type of, uh, characteristic. So I, I do see a lot more people, um, talking about the CU being, uh, interested in the CU and yeah, I think, it's, I think it's valuable to do so. Yeah. And, and, and so you could, you can represent that on a chart. Um, some of the follow up to, to that chart that you posted. Um, I'll put, I'll put a couple of links in the show notes, um, about that, that tweet that you sent out and, uh, and to, and to, um, I, I put a post on pace turf, um, about an example of that type of chart also. And some of the follow-up to that, Bert Sandell from Sweden, he mentioned that um, it's the slope of the line on that particle size distribution curve, the slope between the uh, 10% passing and the 60% passing that actually defines what the CU will be. So if that's mm-hmm. a straight vertical line, then then that is, um, that's going to be a very low CU of one. And if it, if it's a flatter line, then that is going to be a higher CU. And, uh, he, he, he pointed out that you can actually kind of see what type of CU you would have. Not, not, you wouldn't get the exact number, but you can see the type of CU that you would get based on, on how the slope of that line would be. So, um, I think there's some ways to make some graphical innovations of presenting the data. Um, so I think you're, you are working in an exciting area because I think a lot of people will be interested in, in that. Are you doing a, I think you've mentioned you're working on an article about this. Yeah. Working on a, basically an article on root zone selection kind of in, in 2024, knowing how many, construction projects are out there and renovations of existing golf courses just to sort of where we where do we stand with modern green construction and what are the different what are the different methods that people are utilizing you know it's not just usg greens there's more interest in other types of types of construction now than probably ever before with variable depth being being right up there as as something that i see a lot of courses that are interested in uh, doesn't necessarily reduce um the cost of construction, but maybe there's an ROI on the on the back end, um, so that that's always one that's a cost benefit analysis. But looking at the construction types and then really diving into 
you know, the different types of root zones that you could select and, and what sort of the focus should be in, in recognizing the site specific nature of it is really, really important in that, again, the, the USG specs can work in a, in a wide range of environments, clearly. Um, but within that scope, what's right for your property and your climate and your water quality. And, and I actually think there's an opportunity in some cases to go slightly finer um, than, uh, than the USGA specs. It's just a matter of quality control. And again, sort of matching your climate with having a little bit more moisture retention, and then you can get, you know, likely a, a higher CU um, by increasing some fines uh, potentially. So yeah, it's kind of just a, a snapshot of what are the trends in, in construction and what are some things to think about even touching on amendments. Um, I researched a, a fair amount of the the literature on biochar and that is uh that's a bit of a rabbit hole that you can lose you know a couple days doing doing research and reading papers on so i i unfortunately went down that rabbit hole um but you know i feel like i have a much better understanding of kind of the potential for biochar as an amendment and um you know kind of where things are at with with some inorganics and kind of the long-term implications of of maybe you know not having as much access to peat for for blending into uh the root zone mixes so yeah kind of cover all that awesome when when can we expect to see that article sort of just submitted that um you know had uh, wanted some colleagues to uh to provide some feedback to me just to make sure i wasn't too far off the rails with anything but um yeah probably uh, in the next few weeks so I, I think we're looking at distributions certainly on social media but within um, the turfgrass network um, all my clients for miller consulting um, and then you know trying to get it into some some trade publications as well cool so so a, f a few weeks from from now yep yep that's the plan cool I, I i'm looking forward to seeing that uh biochar that's that's uh, a hot topic uh what's your after spending a couple of days looking into that um, what, if you were building a, a nine hole golf course, would you use biochar? You know, I think there's the most promise with the wood based biochars. There's sort of conflicting research right now between kind of the, um, the, the different types of biochars that are out there. And that's a key distinction is that, you know, biochar is, is a very broad term. Um, I do think there's promise. I probably wouldn't pull the trigger myself just yet. I know, um, you know, guys like Dan Danelli and others have had a lot of success using some biochar in, in greens mixes, but, you know, I'm maybe on the, on the more conservative side, you know, I would probably lean more towards trying to find a sand that, um, that I felt was going to help me with moisture retention. And, and probably I'd rather actually look to source maybe a high quality sandy loam topsoil to kind of blend into a mixture. I, I would probably do that before I would look for biochar at this point, but I, I do think there's good potential in talking with um, some colleagues. It does sound like, you know, it, it just needs kind of this final push with research to figure out the, the processing component of it to make biochar work to be a little bit more of a viable alternative. I think it can be a value add, but probably at a small percentage at, at this stage. Um, so we'll see, like I said, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. So as soon as you read some of the research that talks about some of the challenges, it's kind of like hard to get that stuff out of your head and, and focus on some of the benefits too. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just such a widely varying material depending on, yeah. on, on what the parent material, you know, what, what it was made out of and then how it was processed. Um, and so I'm, I'm a big fan of that but I probably wouldn't use it uh, yeah. because I'm not familiar with what any specific type would be. Just like I'm a huge fan of compost, but, but if you talk about compost, you can be talking about a huge range of materials. And I think, uh, I don't know that at construction, I really want to use compost, but if I was a golf course superintendent, I would be, making compost and using compost all the time in various uh, parts of the operation. And, and yet as a, as a really consistent construction material that I know exactly what I'm getting, 
I don't know that that at that scale of a project that I want to use such a, a material that could vary so much. And I kind of feel the same way about biochar. It's like, uh, I, I would like to use it, but maybe, maybe not at a construction. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, the, the research done, this is now 20 years ago from Rutgers actually looked at, they had a, a number of different amendments and kind of the, the combinations and looking at a number of factors and the, the plots with like, I think it was 10% by volume of, of a compost product were some of the best, mm -hmm. but usually the, the quality control, you know, aspect of things is where, you know, there's, there's the breakdown and, and it kind of is the limiting factor for superintendents making that decision as to like, yes, I feel comfortable mixing compost. And, and maybe if you've got a, a source that's close and, and you feel really good about it, it becomes a more viable option. But I think worldwide, that's where some of the inorganics have become a little bit more popular because they are like quality control is really tight. Worldwide distribution is really consistent. And there's a there's a cost, uh, you know, difference in a lot of times with some of the inorganics. But because, you know, you know, you're getting a pretty consistent product, it does seem like that's that's the, the value there that why people are more interested in those than uh, than in years past. Let's uh, let's talk about OM two four six and and uh, sand top dressing a little bit now. Uh, I read the article. I remember reading the article that was published in two thousand sixteen. I think um, you were the co-author with Todd Lowe, and I think it was called Organic Matter Management or or something like that. And I, I remember being a little bit disappointed that. <laughs> you and Todd wrote that in 2016 because I felt like it was still advocating for a traditional way of management, which was top dressing every seven to 14 days at a, a certain amount of sand. You, you said uh, in that article, 0.15 to, oh, sorry, it's 0.5 to 1.5 cubic feet of sand per thousand square feet during the growing season which works out to be 2,400 to 7,200 kilograms of sand per hectare uh, or 0.15 to 0.45 millimeters of sand um, every seven to 14 days. If you add that up over the course of a season, that's, that's a lot of sand. And, and you're also recommending that coring, uh, hollow tine aerification should be a part of, of the program to get some sand in there. And, and I just felt like, man, they're, they're advocating for something that just seems going back to like, again, whether we do things on a program or whether we, we let the weather and the grass conditions at the time kind of uh, inform us and, and we make adjustments based on that. And I just thought, man, now this is going on the record that, that this is being recommended by influential people. And, and I wonder, do you still stick to that recommendation today? Or now that we start doing the OM246 testing a bit more, I know you've done some of those tests. We, we discussed some of that last week, actually, uh, in, a, in a private exchange uh, and what those results are. I, I just wonder if you think there's an opportunity to maybe, maybe put less sand or, or figure out a site-specific amount of sand to put uh, rather than some of those every seven to 14 days, put this much sand type of recommendation. How, how, how would you recommend in 2024? Yeah, I, I was figuring you might bring that article up, Micah. So, uh, that's, that's good. <laughs> uh, I've, I've definitely, uh, changed my thinking, you know, a little bit on that. And, you know, one of the challenges with, with writing an article like that, when it's going to a worldwide audience in particular, that, that time, um, at the USGA, one of our goals was to write sort of these these nationally relevant kind of worldwide type articles that were like the definitive article on this. And so if you look at a lot of articles from, from that time period and, and even slightly before, you would see two agronomists, usually from different parts of the country, um, and, and it was intentional to try to capture kind of what made sense sort of for the entire country, as opposed to what made sense regionally. Um, so that's one part of it is to sort of try to thread a needle or, or kind of 
you know, create a, a recommendation for such a large, uh, a large audience, a large geographical area. Um, and so I think there's going to be times when you, you go too broad or you may go too specific. And I think looking at that article now, you know, it's easy to see, you know, we were probably a little bit too broad and, and didn't customize it, you know, more towards what's right for, you know, kind of the growth rate of the grass. I mean, that was certainly a part of, of our discussion, but we, we looked at what was done in the research. We looked at what was done in the field and these programs were working. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, I think as we've gotten better with data collection clippings in particular, we've been able to tailor everything back down to something that if we're growing less grass, then it's natural top dress less often. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, at least my sense, it would be a disappointing recommendation from a consultant or, or from anyone to just say, you know, top dress as needed. It, it doesn't really tell people a whole heck of a lot. And so I think we wanted to at least give them a starting point. But the top dress as needed is has always been the standard. And, and I think now we're recognizing with data collection, top dress as needed it is much more dynamic throughout the season and can be very specific to a course and not, not so specific to um, even a region. So yeah, I, I definitely think um, you know, my perspective has changed on, on that philosophy, but, you know, at the time, again, there was a lot of those programs that were happening and they were working well. Um, and, and we kind of paired that up with the research that was going on, but that's the nice part about turf grass management is everything evolves. And, you know, if you don't evolve with it, uh, then, you know, you're going to be missing an opportunity to, to kind of help golf courses produce better playing conditions, reduce maintenance, you know, re reallocate maintenance then to, to other tasks. And, and I've certainly recognized over the years that as we've been able to scale back growth, you know, we can scale back a lot of things, including, you know, top dressing every week versus top dressing every, you know, 14, 28 courses may not need to top dress much at all on a given, given summer based on their growth. Yeah, that's, that's, I was making the standard recommendations up until 2014. So uh, I've, I've looked at my slides. The last slide I can find from a presentation about organic matter management in which I was making those old recommendations uh, was, I think, March of 2014. So uh, that, that's uh, almost exactly 10 years ago. I, I was recommending basically to put as much sand as you can get down because I was scared to death that on a sand root zone that the organic material would accumulate near the surface and cause the greens to not function anymore. And I thought that the solution for that was to replace about 20% of the surface area every year by pulling cores or, or, or removing material and putting a lot of fresh sand down to dilute to dilute the organic material. And then I realized, wait a second, uh, if you don't grow that organic material, you don't need to do anything, right? So, so if, it's, if, it's, if you have a dormant uh, green, I've, and I've often talked to people and said, if you have a dormant, uh, let's say you have a dormant ultra dwarf Bermuda grass green and you top dress it on Monday, and it remains dormant through that week, uh, how much sand do you need to put down the next Monday? And, and I think most people would say, you don't need to put that second application of sand. In fact, they might question whether you needed to put that first application of sand onto <laughs> dormant turf. Yeah. And, and, and you start thinking about it at those extremes, and you say, wait a second, if the grass is not growing, we don't need to put any sand. And then it turns out, that to measure this below ground, the OM246 method, which measures the total organic material at specified depths below the surface, uh, can be really effective to see how the organic material under 
the grass, but right at the surface of the root zone, how that's changing, how it's responding to sand top dressing, how it's responding to mineralization uh, and decomposition, uh, how it's responding to plant growth and all of the other things that happen at a site with your water quality, with the way that you like to manage, with the way that the weather's been this year, with the microbial population that, that you have in the soil right now. And it allows you to come up with a really site specific assessment of I'm putting enough, I'm, I need to put more sand, or maybe I can actually get away with putting less. And, and now that's just so ingrained in my mind that that's such a, a logical way to do it, that I, I go back not very far, uh, just to 2014 at my own recommendations and say, what was I recommending? Well, that's crazy. And I look at the 2016 article and say, uh, I mean, I was, I'd already made the, the mental change by that point. So when that article came out, I thought, ah, oh, I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed to, to read it like that. It's, it's good information, but that's not how I want to manage. And now I'm just all about measure how the organic material is changing. And it will tell you if you need to do more, because some places you'll see the organic material goes up and up and up and and at some point as it goes up you're going to get problems uh, related to water infiltration and you're going to get problems eventually with uh, surface firmness um, so the idea is to maximize the organic material in the soil for all of the beneficial reasons that organic material in the soil um, produces so you want to maximize that without causing the negative effects of poor water infiltration and uh surfaces that are too soft and and to me that 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 does not match up with recommending sand every seven to 14 days at fixed rates yeah i think a critical part of that that article and and kind of the benefits of where we are now you know we discussed and and the this was something that's long been you know part of the recommendations um for for many consultants is do organic matter testing and use that as a guide along with how the greens are playing to build your programs. And so if you, if you kind of take a step back into 2016 and where, where kind of people are with organic matter testing, it was, it was all over the place and the depths were, were highly, highly variable um, as to what different soil, um, soil scientists were suggesting for a depth and, even the methods of testing, you know, taking the leaf tissue off versus leaving them on, um, you know, there was there was a bit of that where we were all over the place, and that's where at least with OM two four six now, getting a standardized method, I think allows you to better predict, you know, what your maintenance, kind of what your programs have just done to the greens, what what does the low ground characteristics look like, um, and and how has that changed over time, um, so. That was certainly a part of it was organic matter testing and using that to build your programs back in 2016. And it, it's still that now, I think it's just more accurate with partitioning at those different uh, different depths. Um, but again, I, I look at, at that point, you know, we were asked, okay, what's a starting point? And that's maybe something that um, was something that we could have stressed more was like, this is a, this is, you know, one end of, you know, or one option, one place to start, you may not need this much, you, you know, probably don't need any more. Um, but this is this is at least a starting point with thinking about aeration and top dressing and managing organic matter. Um, and so I think that was that was part of our motivation at that time. But we coupled it with organic matter testing, it was just, it was a bit of the Wild West, you know, then with, again, the, the different, different methods. And so it was very hard to pinpoint kind of how much organic matter is too much and, and, you know, how do you manage that? Yeah. It's, it's, it's so nice that in the United States, this test is, is now being, uh, used a lot more and it's, it's not new. Um, yeah. it's something that, that was done in New Zealand, uh, 20 years ago. Um, it's something that's been done in the UK for a long time. Um, I'm, I'm sure with your turf grass work, many of those clients I'm sure are, are doing that type of testing as a standard and they've been doing it uh, for a long time. Um, and, uh, I, 
I hope to do a series on, on this uh, podcast about uh, some of the history of that type of testing, because I'm interested uh, to talk with people in the UK, to talk with people in New Zealand about how this all got started and why uh, America is so late to the party. Uh, and and uh, anyway, it's good to be at the party now at the or managing, uh, sorry, measuring organic material at specific depths, measuring 100% of it. And it just allows you to tell, is, is the sand top dressing program working? Is my organic matter management program working the way I want? Or is it not working the way I want? And you can then make decisions with a bit more confidence. So it's, uh, it, it, you mentioned earlier how the turf grass management work uh, and, and the way we do things, it's constantly changing. And uh, it's, it's interesting to pay attention to this and see what the most effective maintenance practices are. Yeah, and an, another exciting part in my mind is just sort of standardizing the way, you know, partitioning is, is one aspect that I think is really valuable, looking at those different depths and being consistent, at least knowing zero to two is zero to two for everybody. Um, if you want to go deeper, if you think you need to go deeper, you can just be consistent um, and being able to only compare those those depths to one another. But just using loss on ignition, keeping the turf on, I mean, th those are two big opportunities in my mind where there was inconsistencies between how samples were collected and how samples were processed. Mm -hmm. And those values, you know, testing in a different way can still help you identify trends in organic matter, but I find it's a lot harder to actually see what has, what your maintenance has done to impact those organic matter numbers if they're tested at a different depth or a different process in the lab. You know, you're likely to dilute that number and, and maybe not reflect actually what's going on in the right zone. Yeah, I, I, I was reading an article, um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, from, uh, ecology field. And, and it was about, uh, dissolved organic carbon, uh, some, something like that, which is one of my interests for, for another project. Uh, and it's, it's about what's dissolved in the soil solution. It's, it's not about thatch or anything like that, but, and it, it's not a turf grass paper, but it was so interesting in reading the materials and methods section that they, they just flat out said uh, the soil was prepared by passing through a two millimeter sieve to remove the organic matter. And, and they just said, now that's actually not the correct terminology because that they're, they're removing organic material. It's, it's not soil organic matter because if it passes through that two millimeter sieve, by definition, it will be soil organic matter, but they're removing all the chunks of stuff. And, and, and you think about that's, that's what a, a soil test does. That's, that's all the soil testing methods for standard soil testing. They, they pass the sample through a sieve and you get rid of the roots, you get rid of the stems, you get rid of the thatch, you get rid of the rhizomes, you get rid of any undecomposed living and dead plant material. And yet when we think about the purpose of the top dressing, what we're trying to achieve by core aeration or scarification or dry jacked or something, it's, it's all related to, uh, managing everything. It's, it's not, not related to, well, let's, let's forget about the thatch, forget about the, the, that mat layer. And let's just think about only those tiny organic matter particles that are smaller than two millimeters in diameter. That's, that's not the way we think. And so this test, um, it's, it's really cool to have a, a standard method, uh, that, uh, that, and, and standard depths and everything that, that people can be confident that they're looking at a, a 7% organic matter number in the top two milli top two centimeters, the top 0 0.8 inches. That's, uh, that's good. What do you think about the, uh, the depths? I like doing zero to two centimeters because that's less than an inch. So it's more precise. It's, it's 20% more precision because we're dealing with a zero to uh, 0 0.8 inch depth rather than a zero to one inch depth. And you increase that precision as you go down to four centimeters into six. 
So for one reason, I like it because it's more precise. Number two, it allows us to directly compare to some some other tests that have been done all around the world at, at greens in other countries that are also done at those depths. For your clients in the U.S., do you recommend to them to go in inch increments or to go in uh, two centimeter increments? Micah, the hashtags OM246, it, it's that simple. Um, honestly, Good answer. Like, it, it doesn't, to me, you use the, the phrase, you know, we're late to the party um, in the U.S. To, to do this. You know, and that's I'm not uh, I'm not going to debate you on that. that. I think that's very accurate. And so because of that, like, it just makes sense. Let's go with the worldwide metric. Let's go with where we've got, you know, massive databases and where we've got people that have been doing, you know, the, these same partitioning depths at, at the two centimeters, the two to four and the four to six, you know, for, for two decades now. So that's what I recommend. I think that's what makes the most sense. I hope that's where the, the final ASTM standard falls because, again, that's just, to me, I think your, your points about the accuracy are, are, are certainly well taken. I just, I look at the, if we already have such a strong database at these depths, like we, we don't really have to totally start over if we go with inches, but it, it brings in that, brings that potential of like, well, can we compare it if we're going just a little bit deeper um, to, to all these OM2 samples and now we're going to zero to one. So, you know, I think you, you, you and, uh, Chris Traderbaugh, when he came up with the hashtag, you, you sealed the fate there. So yeah. Yeah. That, that, that was, that was a really good one. Uh, I, I am so grateful to him for coming up with that. But now the question is, should it be T O M? Uh, and, and I've had it suggested, uh, because O M kind of means one thing. Uh, so if you put T O M on it, but I feel like, mm, like the OM two four six hashtag is nice and succinct and uh, and and uh, yeah, if you put a T O M, it may not be so clear that we're referring to organic matter. So, I would I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't go that route. I mean, perfect example is the title is Pro V one. You know that wasn't the original idea for their name uh of that golf ball that was just like the you know whatever the model number it was but it just sort of caught on and it, and it worked so om246 caught on it works it makes sense yeah okay you can it's nuanced and debate whether or not you need that uh the total part of it on there or not but i think everyone our, our audience knows what uh what we're talking about well I think they do, Adam. And I think that is about enough talking about this stuff. We're going to meet up again in Canada and again in April, I think. Uh, and maybe we'll discuss some of these things further. And then maybe we can decide to have another show and, and, and talk about some of this stuff in even more detail. Thanks so much for joining me. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share or, or say before we go? No, thanks for having me, Micah. This was fun. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening and for watching. And I think uh, we will be sure to read Adam's article when it comes out about the the uh, the sand. It's about physical properties of of root zone materials. Is that is that right, Adam? Yeah, putting rain root zone selection and uh, a little bit on construction methods. Yeah, that's, that's going to be good. So we got all kinds of things to look forward to. And uh, maybe we can talk about that again after, after uh, I've read that. So cool. Thanks for joining. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll sign off now for ATC from Bangkok. I'm Michael Woods. Bye-bye.